Cognitive psychology is the branch of psychology concerned with how our minds process the information sent from our various senses. Most of the work from cognitive psychologists has been to quantify how efficient we are at processing this type of information, how much we can process, and how quickly. More recently, however, cognitive psychologists have become interested in how the mind processes information generated from working with other humans and external artifacts, such as computers. Psychologists believed that the human brain was some sort of information processing machine, which was fed input from senses and stored images, thoughts, etc., in memory. The discipline of cognitive psychology describes the mind as a general purpose system for processing symbols that is limited by both structural and resource limitations. In this context, a symbol is a pattern stored in memory which represents or points to something in the external world. Various processes in the mind manipulate and transform symbols from one sort to another. The goal of cognitive psychologists is to define these processes and representations to give an understanding of how well our mind will perform a given task. Obviously, human-computer interaction can benefit from this work by building models of user performance and defining design guidelines which are sympathetic to the way our mind processes the information being displayed on a computer screen. Cognitive psychology also offers the possibility of building user models, essentially computer programs which react the same way to certain stimuli as humans. These models can be used to test an interface and predict the types of problems users could experience. Cognitive psychology can also be used after an interface has been constructed to give insight into why users are experiencing problems with that interface. In a future unit, you will be shown different models of how the brain processes its inputs. In this unit, however, we are primarily concerned with how humans process visual information. We will investigate how our minds process visual information and how this processing can be exploited to improve interface design. You will also discover that our eye is a lot more complex than a simple camera and that our minds often embellish the images received from the eye. Visual Perception have you ever stopped to consider how amazing the human vision system is? It allows you to see in very bright and dull environments. It allows you to detect minute variations in color. And it also allows you to detect rapid movement, be that a darting animal or a sudden flash of lightning. However, the eye is not perfect. We are limited to a narrow spectrum of colors between ultraviolet and infrared. Some objects move too quickly or too slowly to see any movement. These aspects, however, are governed by the physical composition of the eye. What we are interested in is how the brain processes the information which the eye does manage to capture. If we are to create usable interfaces, then we need to examine how the brain processes the information presented to it. There are a number of theories which have been proposed to explain how we process what we see. Broadly speaking, they fall into two main categories, constructivist and ecological. Constructivist theories state that our visual perception of the world is constructed by applying our knowledge of the world to what our eyes are currently seeing. Ecological theories, however, state that there is no high-level processing, we extract information directly from the light captured by the eye. Neither approach is exclusively correct, and there is much evidence supporting both points of view. Constructivist theories are all based on the idea that we do not perceive the world directly. That we process any image we see before it is consciously recognized. There are many different types of constructivist theory, perhaps the best known is Gestalt theory, which we shall discuss in the next section. This has quite a few far-reaching implications. For instance, one consequence of the constructivist approach is that a child must learn some base amount of knowledge before it can see, as we understand the term see. To illustrate their point, 
the constructivists show how the mind uses contextual information and world knowledge to affect what we see. By using optical illusions, we are challenged to question if what our eye detects is really what we see. Consider the following figure, figure 1. A 12, 13, 14, fig 1 C. What do you see? Is the middle symbol a, b, or a, 13? The context in which we see a symbol has a huge influence over how we see it. What about the sentence in figure 2? The symbol in the middle of each word is clearly identical, yet we are able to see it differently in each context. The cat, fig 2. Our brain is able to use information about the context in which a symbol appears. It can use the contextual information to disambiguate the symbol so that we see complete and meaningful words. Contextual perception obviously has applications in interface design. For instance an icon design, which means one thing in one part of the interface, might mean something completely different in another place. A good example of this is the checkbox. Usually this symbol is used to show whether an item is selected or not. But, it is also the symbol used to denote close when used in the top right corner of a window in Windows 95-98-2000. Again, in the different contexts, we see different buttons, even though the representation is identical. From childhood, humans develop a huge knowledge about objects and how to recognize them. Our perceptual systems exploit this knowledge, allowing us to recognize objects when parts of that object are obscured. In Figure 3, we can readily identify the wine glass, even though roughly half the original information is obscured. The final glass is much harder to identify. Not only is much more information missing, but crucial details such as the contour of the glass is not present. A lot of research has been conducted into the types of information our perceptual systems need to identify objects. Edge information and contour information is vital. Other information, in particular color, is largely redundant. Even an object which is heavily reliant on color to identify it, such as a banana, can be as quickly recognized in black and white. Again, this information about our ability to perceive incomplete objects is useful at the user interface. When designing graphics where screen area is restricted, as is the case for an icon, we can show those edges which most define an object without worrying about color information. The term just alt refers to something which has a well-structured form, a form which is often more than the sum of its parts. For instance, four lines arranged in a square form, something which we primarily recognize as square, not as a collection of four lines arranged in some fashion. Guest alt theory would argue that our perception of the lines is influenced by the knowledge we have about geometric shapes. In this case the square, which causes us to perceive a square, and not individual lines. The constructivism, described by Gestalt theory, therefore, is the way our mind's knowledge of different types of form, affect our perception. The relationship between the lines and the muller liar illusion, figure 4, serves as a good example of how our brain constructs something more, from the lines, than is actually found in the diagram. In this instance, our brain constructs views from the two groups of three lines, such that the top horizontal line looks longer than the horizontal line beneath it. In actual fact, they are both the same length. One key form in the Gestalt theory is the idea of figure and ground. Look at figure 5. What do you see? Do you see a complete triangle with a circle placed on top of it? Or, do you see a triangle with a circular hole through which you can't see the square beneath? In other words, is the circle part of the figure or is it part of the ground? Presenting the distinction between figure and ground is essential if we are to produce pictures and icons which are unambiguous. 
let's consider the following symbols, figure 6, which could be used to represent exit. When drawing images like this on a page or a computer screen, you need to be careful that you are not confusing your user about what is part of the foreground and what is part of the background in your image. The idea of figure and ground has implications when designing symbols such as icons. One rule we can infer is in marking boundaries, it is better to use a solid shape than just an outline. By using a contrast boundary, the black arrow stands out more than the outlined arrow. Another application of figure and ground distinction is increasing the amount of information conveyed without increasing the amount of ink used to represent that information. Often, computer graphics can become cluttered and hard to read because the designer is trying to convey a lot of information in a small space. To illustrate the point, consider the graph on the left. Here the information being presented as represented by the height of the bars is drawn in the same color as the contextual information, the lines of the graph. The graph on the right, however, exploits figure and ground to show the information in one color but keep the context information as part of the ground. One of the main contributions of guest alt theory is in the principles by which objects group themselves in visual perception. There are five different types of grouping, proximity, similarity, closure, continuity, and symmetry. Proximity In figure 8, a uh, the dots could be organized in rows or columns. Due to the proximity of dots in 8, b, the dots arrange themselves in columns. Conversely, the dots in 8, c, appear in rows. Proximity need not only apply to organized items, then, tendency to group by proximity can be seen in random allocation such as 8D. Similarity Objects of similar shape or color will be perceived to be grouped together as in figure 9. Closure Rather than appearing as three separate lines, the application of closure to perception means that we see a circle and a hexagon in figure 10. Continuity By using continuity and perception, we tend to see two distinct trails of dots in figure 11 and not a single dot shape. Symmetry Areas that are surrounded by symmetrical lines tend to be recognized as shapes rather than the lines being perceived as shapes in their own right. Grouping too closely. Grouping objects too closely together can play tricks on your perceptual system, causing an illusion called moray movement. Stare at the following image, 13, and you should experience the effect. This can be a problem in computer graphics, as in figure 14. There is a lot of evidence to support the theories of constructivist perception. In particular, the grouping laws of Gestalt theory have proven themselves in a wide variety of experiments and applications. But do our minds process every image we see in such detail? Whilst working on training fighter pilots in the Second World War, psychologist J.J. Gibson came to the conclusion that constructivism was not the whole story. Instead, Gibson and his followers claim that we could perceive information directly from our environment without any higher level processing. Ecologists argue that our eyes and minds have adapted to our environment over millions of years of evolution and therefore are optimized to perceive that environment very efficiently. Furthermore, they argue that the experiments of the constructivists operate in a controlled environment, the laboratory, which cannot capture how an eye perceives in its natural environment. Ecologists are therefore interested in what cues our eyes can take directly from the light in the surrounding environment. One of Gibson's main arguments about perception is that movement is a crucial part of the process. Our eyes are rarely presented with a static view of a scene, instead we tend to walk around, giving our eyes a constantly changing range of viewpoints. Consider a textured surface, which we are trying to observe. As we walk closer to that surface, our perception of it changes, 
and we are able to see increasing levels of detail. The changes in this surface are not random, there is a gentle change in detail, to which our eyes are accustomed. Gibson calls this, change in perception optic flow. Reproducing optical flow convincingly, is a big problem in computer interfaces. In a virtual environment, for instance, we can model object surfaces, by giving them a fixed texture. As we walk around the virtual environment, objects change size. In accordance with perspective rules, object sizes can be rescaled according to well-understood mathematical rules. What does not change, however, is the texture or detailing on surfaces. The transitions in surface detail are not well understood, and quite often, the solution is to store a model for remote viewing and one for close viewing. The resultant effect is unsettling as objects suddenly change from blurred to pin sharp detail with only the smallest of movements through the virtual environment. This problem is called popping and can be seen in the images on the next slide. In figure 15, the viewer is standing back from the cow. As they move a few millimeters forward, the computer decides that they should be able to see more detail, and suddenly the cow has an eye, as can be seen in figure 16. Optical flow turns out to be just one case, in a wider family of invariants. Invariant is the word Gibson uses for any perceived pattern of change within the observed environment. Invariants are the patterns of change which are familiar to our visual system. One particularly important class of invariant is the affordance which we shall investigate next. One idea of Gibson's which is crucial to interface design is that of an affordance. Gibson says that our environment contains invariant information, the successful detection of which has survival implications for the observer. These affordances which objects provide give the observer clues about how they might be used, sit on able, grasp able, throw able, etc. In effect, the affordances provide the meaning the environment has for the observer, showing them what is possible within that environment. The interaction possibilities provided by the affordances has been called the effectivities of an environment. Remember that the ecologists are claiming that these affordances are being perceived directly. There is no conscious processing. Therefore, the properties of an object, which make it appear graspable, can be directly inferred from nothing more than the reflected light from that object striking our eyes. This is quite the bold claim which the ecologists defend by arguing the subtle and inextricable links between observer and observed environment. Regardless of the exact mechanism of how we perceive affordances, their effect in computer interfaces is profound. One psychologist who recognized the importance of affordances in designing interfaces was Donald Norman. He showed that interface elements could be designed to afford how the user should interact with them. Consider the button below, part of the original Macintosh interface. How do we know that this is in fact a button? How does it afford pushing? A better version of the button would be. In this case, we can see that the button is raised off the page, so could perhaps be pushed level with the page. As computers became more powerful, color could be added to interfaces, providing even better affordances. By using a beveled edge and a metallic color, the button now looks like its real-world counterpart. The result is an on-screen button, which provides the same affordances as its more familiar real-world counterpart. Norman used a wide variety of examples ranging from computer interfaces to door handles showing how badly designed objects could afford one style of interaction but actually use another. A common example of this are door handles. Handles of the type found in figure 16 afford pushing, whilst those in figure 17 afford pulling. Quite often the plates in figure 16 are used for pulling the door open. This is why people often spend ages pushing, pull doors, or indeed pulling. Push doors, as the handle affords, the wrong type of interaction. Where handles are used inappropriately, they are often marked with an instruction, as in figure 18. Look at the two graphics. 
one is a button, and the other is a text box. How do you know which is which? The one on the left is the button, the one on the right is the text box. The only difference between them is the shading on their edges. In the convention of user interfaces, buttons are raised and text boxes are recessed. This only works, however, if we imagine a light source shining from the top left-hand corner of the screen. If the light shone from the bottom right of the screen, we would perceive the left image to be the text box and the right-hand image to be the button. Fortunately, all graphical user interfaces assume a light source at the top left-hand corner of the screen. Therefore, any image or icon you create on the screen should have its top and left edge drawn in a lighter color if it is to be perceived as a raised object. All recessed images should have their top and left edges drawn in a darker color. Look at the buttons at the top of this browser and you will see that the top and left edges are drawn in a lighter color than the rest of the button. One consideration to bear in mind is that our perceptual systems are shaped by the culture in which we grow up. Therefore, if you are creating an interface for a different culture than your own, it is well worth investigating cultural differences between you and the target user group. Culture can affect both constructivist and ecological perception, as seen in the following examples. In the Western world, rooms tend to be rectangular with right-angled corners. Consequently, our cues about distance to objects rely on successfully processing the perspective of rectangular objects. But what about people who grow up in a culture where there are no straight lines? One such group of people are the Zulus, who live in circular huts, and even plow their fields with curved furrows. For Zulus, the straight-line optical illusions which trouble us have little or no effect on them. Affordances between cultures can also become confused. Work from anthropologists reveals many anecdotes, such as the tribe which when first were presented with spoons, used the bowl of the spoon to grasp, and scooped with the handle. So, if you are designing an interface for a culture other than your own, spend some time learning how their culture may have influenced their visual perception systems.